the Stephen Blackwell Show, searching the web for the most creative, intriguing, and captivating people in the world. Welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. Before we begin, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. This episode is brought to you by BookBannersEtc.com and Willow Kestel Jewelry. If you enjoy the show and would like to become a sponsor, you can by contacting me directly at emmett.blackwell at gmail.com. On this episode, I have returning guest, author, and cartoonist Pierre C. Arsenault to talk about his newest novel, Poplar Falls, The Death of Charlie Baker. Pierre has authored and co-authored such works as Oakwood Island, Sleepless Nights, and The Dark Tales for Dark Nights. In this latest book, Poplar Falls, The Death of Charlie Baker, he uses his amazing storytelling abilities to create a town that is, in itself, a character in the story. His dark humor shines through on this murder mystery that begins with a body tied to a four-post bed. The cast of characters in this book are anything but ordinary. We are very excited and very happy to have Pierre C. Arsenault back on the show. And hello, Pierre. How are you doing today? Pretty good. So um, it's a pleasure having you back on the show. I mean, it's been a long time since we've talked to each other. What have you been up to since then? Uh, Thank you for having me again. Uh, Yeah, the last time we spoke, we were talking about Oakwood Island, which had just come out. Uh, Since then, there's been, uh, I think at the time, I was already working on a new book, uh, which is the one we're going to be talking about today. Um, that's, uh, Poplar Falls. And since then I've been, you know how it is. You're always, when you finish one and you're starting to promote that one, you're typically already working on something else. And I, as a matter of fact, just now handed out, handed, uh, a new book to my publisher, a new horror novel. Um, and, uh, there's a sequel to Oakland Island in the works as well with Angela Cormier. Um, uh, so it's been, I've been pretty busy. Yeah, and actually, I had just uh, signed up to uh, get the pre-sale on that, um, so I'm I'm really excited to get it too. So <laughs> it's kind of cool. So it's now, fantastic. yeah, well, and that's the thing too is I love I love grabbing pre-sale books because uh, for one, it's kind of like a little Christmas surprise, you know, <laughs> you get this little book, uh, uh, but it's it's awesome. I like it on my Kindle. So now, um, you're from New Brunswick. Uh, I have to ask because I'm from Michigan here. How's the weather going on up there? Um. Today we got a foot of snow. Oh, yeah, <laughs> only a foot. <laughs> yeah, only a foot. Uh, but it sounds like it's always winter. It's always, you know, it's up and downs. I mean, it's typical, especially these last few years. Uh, a few weeks back we had a rain overnight. It was really mild, and it froze overnight, and we had a skating rink everywhere for like a full week. It was incredible. But at least typically – this time of year, you're obligated to make a mosquito joke at least once. <laughs> so, you know, the, I I sometimes tell people I have uh, three million two hundred and seventeen mosquitoes, free range mosquitoes. I keep them outside. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, not this time of year. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely the wintry time of year, which actually is is great for some writers too. That you know they love the the seclusion of being able to just kind of you know huddle in inside and start writing. Um, now I've exactly known, right. yeah, and now I've known that you were a writer, okay. But what I didn't realize is that you're also a cartoonist. Um, how does being a cartoonist differ from being a writer, other than the obvious? Uh, well, writing is something you chip away. Uh, very slowly at, uh, you don't write a book overnight. You don't do, it takes a long time to put an idea down and, and flesh it out and work it all out. The best way I can sum up cartooning is I once had an idea. I laughed out loud. I literally laughed at my own idea. I took about three hours to draw it. Then I realized it wasn't even funny. <laughs> That's probably the best way I could sum up cartooning. Yeah, I, I guess I could see that. <laughs> now, we had talked um, about some of your earlier works uh, on the previous episode in fiction, and they were simply terrifying. I mean, Oakwood Island, Dark Tales, and Dark Nights, you wrote those and co-authored uh, with Angela Jacob. And it seems as though you really have gotten the grasp for short fiction. What inspired you to start writing a full novel? Uh, essentially, in my opinion, the tale kind of dictates, dictates the length. Uh, the story itself, depending on what the story requires, depending on the length it's going to be. Uh, if you just want to tell a short little story, the, 
you you write till you're finished. You don't you don't try to stretch it out, try to add anything, try to you just kind of write till you're comfortable and you're finished. That's what I love about short stories. Mm -hmm. The thing with a novel is you have to aim for novel length. You have to aim for word count. You have to, and I find myself obsessing over that a little bit, only because I want to make sure it's novel length and it's, and and so it's you get a different uh, a different perspective from it. But there's also a lot to be done with novels, whereas you can flesh out back characters and different things and add uh, more storyline and maybe have like multiple stories going on at once and, and different things. It's, it's, it's both are fantastic. They're both fun. Sadly, there's less market for short stories. I find maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's more of a market for it now seems to be, but Oh yeah, I mean on Kindle, I, I look for, I look for short stories. I look for full length novels. The only problem is I really don't have a lot of time to read full length novels. So when I get a chance to read a short story, it's quick. It's it's right to the point. And you know I've actually taken some short stories and read them out loud and uh, with family members and things like that. And and it's fun because like especially when Halloween comes around and you want a good scary story or or uh, on a nice summer night. And maybe I'm just reminiscing about the heat wave of summer. But uh, it's great to have something around the campfire, even when you're camping, you know? Yes. Um, I have to admit, uh, the short stories in my previous works uh, varied in length. And again, it's, it's, it just depends on what you're trying to tell. Sometimes, a lot of times with short stories, I find I'll have a beginning and an end for an idea, and I don't really have a middle. And I'll flesh out as I go, and I'll build. And so then you just write until you're finished. And uh, with a novel, it's different. You almost have to plan a little bit, depending on the novel, depending on what you're writing. You have to plan more. You have to, depending, and it just, it varies. Yeah, definitely. Now, I know that you are about to release a new book called Poplar Falls, The Death of Charlie Baker, and it's up for pre-order now. Like I said, I already got my copy, uh, the pre-order copy, um, and hopefully that'll be coming soon. Um, tell us a little bit about this story. What helped inspire it? Uh, that's, that's a funny story because... I'm sitting in my office, I'm sitting in front of my computer, and I'm itching to write, and I have no idea what I want to write, but I want to start something new. One of the things that was in my mind is a lot of people tell me, uh, well, I've had some people tell me they didn't like reading horror, so then, you, you know how it is, sometimes you'll talk to people you know, and they'll be like, I don't, I'd love to read your stuff, but I don't like to read scary stories. So with that in mind, and my sense of humor in my back pocket, which is <laughs> quite twisted, um... I started writing the story and I didn't know what I wanted to write. And I looked over to my bookshelf and I saw a cover of a book. Yeah. The book itself was Gerald's game by, by Stephen King. Oh yeah. And when I turn, when I turn over and I look at the book sitting on the shelf, it's a picture of a bedpost from a four from a, from a bed frame or bed post, or whatever, uh, with a set of handcuffs hanging off of it. And I'm thinking to myself, well, this is quirky <laughs> and I can, I can do something with that. And I wrote an opening scene of a body being found handcuffed to a bed. And, uh, so that's, that's how the story started. Yeah. You typically don't find that kind of thing on the real estate market nowadays, but you know, <laughs> man, wow. That, that is incredible. Now, uh, we'll be right back with Pierre to talk about his newest release after a message from our sponsors. Have you ever found yourself looking for a gift but just can't find something that's unique and different? There are many online shops to find jewelry, but most of those sites carry manufactured creations that are mass-produced. The internet is at your fingertips. You shouldn't have to travel through all the realms to get something amazing. At Willow Kestrel Jewelry, you will find handcrafted creations. Whether you are looking for wire-wrapped pendant, natural shells, or beautiful precious gemstones, you will find it all at Willow Kestrel Jewelry Shop at Etsy.com. Willow Kessel Jewelry uses genuine gemstones, including amethyst, moonstone, citrine, rose quartz, laramar, malachite, sapphire, and many more. You can make it rain with gemstones. I know I did. And it felt like I had been transported back in time to when me and my friend had to take a ring back to a mountainous volcano and toss it in to save the world. Now you can use the coupon code BLACKWELL20, that's BLACKWELL with the number 20, to save 20% at checkout. Search Willow Kessel Jewelry under shops at etsy.com today. In a world full of obstacles and haphazard graphics, one company has broken the mold of building amazing book covers, banners, video trailers, and more. Book Banners Etc. is your premier source for the most epic designs. Constructed from the mind of independent author Lynn Lamb, 
book banners, etc. is dedicated to making your dream a reality. They offer an array of marketing materials at affordable prices. If you're looking for book covers that pop, banners that captivate, swag for signing, and alluring video trailers, stop by www.bookbannersetc.com. That's bookbannersetc.com. Imagine your world, then make it epic with www.bookbannersetc.com. All right, and we are back. Now, in your newest book, Popular Falls, The Death of Charlie Baker, detectives Franklin Dodge and Roxanne Tilly investigate a bizarre murder. They follow clues, and an old case of a notorious panty bandit starts to resurface. Then, to top it all off, gossip spreads around town about uh, from this group of ladies known as the Naughty Knitters. So, first off... <laughs> Uh, I, I can just sense this being funny, dark, funny kind of stuff. Um, what inspired the naughty knitters, ladies? Um, I had a lot of fun with those characters. <laughs> uh, the very, very first inspiration was the fact that I wanted a group of older ladies. And what there is in this, in Poplar Falls, there's a uh, Magnolia Wellness Rehabilitation Center, mm -hmm. which is basically a ther therapy they treat, you know, uh, all kinds of addictions, including sex, sexual addiction. And this is a group of ladies, mature ladies, who are doing a sex therapy class. <laughs> but while they're doing this, they're knitting. And because they're older ladies, they knit and whatnot. And I know that sounds stereotypical, but stereotypes exist for a reason. And these ladies knit and they gossip and they do their therapy. And I just love the idea of the characters. And that's where... I came up with the idea of naughty knitters because that's what they call themselves. They call themselves the naughty knitters. <laughs> and they, that's great. It really is. <laughs> they, they were just a ball to write. Uh, the back and forth dialogue between those characters was just fantastic. Um, and not, not to toot my own horn, but it was a lot of fun to write. Yeah. And that's, that's the best part is, is when you have fun writing. So now who are the other characters that you have in this book? Uh, there's a large variety of characters in here. I mean, uh, if I was to just kind of bounce off a few, there's uh, uh, the one of the, one of the naughty knitters, Emma O'Brien. Uh, she's like the the leader of the pack. Um, there's a, she's a therapist at the wellness clinic as well, so which is why she's the leader of the pack. There's Sam Elder who owns the Elder Funeral Home. There's Red Realty, which is run by Marcy Grant. There's uh, Vernon Cross who owns the butcher shop. There's Sadie Cross who owns a, a local uh, daycare. Uh, Rainbow, Sunshine and Rainbow's Daycare. There's, <laughs> there's so many characters, the, the CSI characters of Lemke and Calvin. Uh, I know it sounds like a lot of characters, and it is. And to be honest with you, I absolutely love a large cast in a book. Yeah. And what I like about it, too, is you can develop each and every character and have their own little storylines and their own backgrounds and their own thing going on. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and actually, like, I mean, I talk to other authors about this, too, is, is when you take a world like this, and I think I was talking to you about this, when you take a world and you kind of put people into a town and, and you're able to develop the characters and and actually kind of just go with it, you know? I mean, it's so creative to go ahead and get into these different people's lives, and the fact that you've set such a stage for these people, I mean, this notorious panty bandit, I mean, <laughs> honestly, it's 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 great because it's like, for one, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, like, dark humor, you know? And I also like, you know, the, the kind of murderous mystery story at the same time, and, and the, the fact that you can incorporate humor into it is even better. Um, the, the Pandy Band, it sounds like it's funny, mm -hmm. but in a way it isn't. It's kind of a horrific thing when you think about the invasion of privacy and all that stuff. And I actually play on that in the story. Mm. I play on the fact that it's it's something serious while it's something that I, I, I kind of put humor to and I put so there's dark places where this book goes but it is dark comedy mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a blend yeah and now this this mystery is like I said before it's kind of quirky yet it has those classic elements like you were talking about how did you incorporate the classic mystery elements with this stra strange quirkiness of Poplar Falls when I originally started writing it I wanted to write a serious detective novel that didn't pan out too well <laughs> uh because my sense of humor kept getting in the way and I kept writing these odd characters would just kind of pop up. And I know people say characters write themselves. No, they don't. You make them up. And when I started writing Emma O'Brien, I realized I had something that was really going to be funny. Emma and Bill O'Brien, which are husband and wife, 
Um, Emma runs the uh, is the uh, is one of the therapists at the uh, rehabilitation center. Uh, when I started writing these characters, they were so quirky; they come off really funny. And I kind of pictured a Betty White with a uh, <laughs> I forget his name, but the the the, the, the fellow who was in uh, my favorite Martian, the old fellow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I pictured these kind of characters, these kind of people. Uh, just kind of bantering back and forth, and it just kind of, it just kind of started having a sense of humor to it. And the more I wrote, the more the humor started kind of wedging itself in, and I realized I was going to write a dark comedy after a while. Yeah, it, and that's the thing you mentioned, Betty White. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I I like I like Betty White. I've always liked Betty White ever since she was in the Golden Girls. That's as far as back as I can remember. And and it's almost like she has she could play any role that was thrown in front of her. It, it really is amazing. Um, so now, do you plan? You said you planned on turning this into a series, right? Uh, series, I don't know if I'd use the word series. I definitely plan on going back to Poplar Falls for another book. Mm. There's, there's no doubt about that. The characters were just too much fun to not go back. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, I mean, in the meantime, right now, I just handed off another uh, horror novel, uh, which is more serious horror than comedic, uh, to my publisher. Uh, Oakland Island Volume 2 is in the works with Angela Corney again. Oh, good, um, good. And uh, I think before... Uh, like those two things are almost finished, um, and I think before I go back to to Poplar Falls, I think I want to go back to Carlton, which Carlton is a setting that was very prominent in uh, Sleepless Nights, which was my uh, anthology. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I want to go back there and tell a story about Carlton, and, and to me, settings tend to become almost like a character, and that's one of the things that I loved about Oakwood Island as much, because when Angela first created it, it was it was just a ball, and and just the char- the place almost becomes a character, and I've done that with every single setting that I've done that I've done so far. And Poplar Falls is probably the best example so far, mm-hmm. but and which is one of the reasons I definitely want to go back there. Yeah, definitely. So now, um, anybody who's out there who is listening, um, Pierre has such a wide range of writing when it comes to his stuff. And if if you get a chance, check out Poplar Falls: The Death of Charlie Baker. Um, by Pierre Arsenault, and it, it really is intriguing when you read what this story is about, and, and definitely get your pre-order, because like I said, I got my pre-order set up, I'm going to be getting this book, uh, when is this book supposed to be released? I believe it's March 19th, if I remember the date correctly. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've, yeah. Cool. Uh, March 19th. Awesome. So I'll be looking at my Kindle for that and uh, definitely get your pre-order out there, guys. Um, so now we've we've hit the part of the show, Pierre, where um, we actually put our uh, authors and our guests through uh, some sort of uh, game or some sort of trial by fire. And uh, <laughs> we're going to do the same thing to you. So um, now we've chosen this game, uh, Two Truths and One Lie. Okay, now here's how it works. You're going to pick Two truths and one lie. You're not going to tell me which one's which, and I have to guess which one is a lie. And for each one that you get correct, you'll get a 1,000 points. For each one that I get correct, um, I'll get the respect of the author who is the guest today, Pierre Ar- Arsenal. So, <laughs> And um, we'll, we'll go ahead and go through this game. So do you want me to start? Uh, sure. All this right. could be a little awkward because uh, uh, just getting getting my feet under me uh, for this, but uh, let's give it a try. All right. All right. Here we go. And the first one. All right. One thing is that I'm afraid of scissors. The second thing is I own a cat. And the third thing is I can drive a stick shift. I'm going to say that you're uh, you don't own a cat. Oh, no, I do own a cat. You want a cat? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, all right. There's a point for me. All right. What, now, what's his name? Oh, it's a uh, Polly. It's a girl. Yeah. Polly. F- names fascinate me. That's why I asked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, she's a uh, uh, Polly Dextral. Okay. So she has like more paws than what a normal cat does. So it looks like she has thumbs. It's kind of creepy, really. I mean, I think about like the evolution of cats, and I think, oh, oh boy, here we go. And then, you know, you come home, this thing's texting, and you're like, hey, get off of there. But anyhow, (laughs) go ahead with yours. Well, I'm the youngest of 11 children. Um, I once had a car painted like a cow, white with black spots. (laughs) 
and I uh, do amateur dentistry with carbon garden tools. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of trying to picture the fact that you do amateur dentistry, but um, <laughs> I think that that one is the lie. <laughs> Uh, yes, it is. Okay, yeah. Oh, man. And you know what, though? Um, you probably could go into that, uh, start a school if you want to, and um, really get started. You know, it's like a launch project. I don't know. <laughs> the uh, dentistry, yeah. I, I'm not sure I would get very many customers, but. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Anyhow, let's go with another one. All right. Um, when I was young, I had a dog that was a husky and a St. Bernard mixed. When I was also young, I actually got to travel to New York City. And when I was young, I also, um, uh, I was friends with Macaulay Culkin. Well, that one sounds like it might be a lie. Oh, uh, yeah, you got me. Yeah, I wasn't a friend with Macaulay Culkin. Yeah, we're about the same age, though, but it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He was always yeah. left home alone, and nobody knew why. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, so we're going to do one more, and um, we'll see if you can uh, stump me on this one. If you can, then um, then you'll win the game with uh, 12 billion points. And the points can't be used for anything, and they don't have any monetary purpose, but you, know, you can say you have them. <laughs> I don't own a cell phone. I have a collection of about 800 DVD movies. And I still own a tube TV after all these years. Oh, man. Um, I think the lie is that you owned a tube TV, or that you owned a tube TV. Uh, nope. Uh, what? The, you... the lie is that I don't have a cell phone. No way. You... Uh, I do have a cell phone. And, uh, yeah, I'm an old school guy that can't get rid of stuff before it dies on me. So I still actually own and operate a tube TV at the moment. Man, how old is that thing? <laughs> when, when was that thing created? I bought that thing in 2001. It still works like a charm. I just can't convince myself. I'm my father's son. I can't convince myself to get rid of something that works. But still, I mean, that's got to be so vintage sitting there. I love vintage <laughs> stuff. It is so cool. That is awesome. <laughs> so, it plays everything. I mean, it plays yeah. everything great. I just can't. It weighs about 300 pounds. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they if somebody do. breaks into my house, they will probably leave me money on my coffee table. <laughs> Just for the TV. <laughs> yeah, they'll be like, buy yourself a TV, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, it was a pleasure having you here on the show again, Pierre. It was it was awesome. I'm really excited about getting my copy of the um, Poplar Falls book. And um, anybody who's out there who's listening, check out Amazon.com. Check out Poplar Falls. And um, it was a pleasure having you here on the show. Uh, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Emmett. All and, right. Uh, yeah, I love your show. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. It's the Emmett Blackwell Show, searching the web for the most creative, intriguing, and captivating people in the world.